Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Samantha, the Maternity Mentor, and we're here for another one of our live Q&A sessions that we have every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is my chance to interact with you guys and to answer any questions that you have live, as well as answer any questions that you guys may have put onto the videos this week. Um, remember, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional content. Those will be linked into the description. And please share the channel with your friends and family. And most importantly, please like and subscribe to the channel. Subscribing to the channel really helps me out as a content creator. And for those of you who aren't aware, we are now a part of the YouTube Health platform, which is really exciting because this is an area of YouTube where you can go and get um, information about health that has been um, verified by YouTube to be um, created by um, vetted healthcare providers like myself. Um, for those of you who are joining me, um, I am definitely on location, aka in a car, because I am going out to be filming in just a few minutes. And so that's why you see me in this particular um, scenery. Um, also, hopefully my sound is good. Please let me know, guys, if you can't um, hear me as well as you normally do. Um, while you guys are kind of starting in here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get started on some of the questions that you guys have asked me on the videos. But please feel free to put any questions that you have into the chat. So we had a lot of good questions um, this week. And a lot of them were very, very unique, actually. So I thought they were very good. So I'm going to start with antibiotics. Um, I had a question that said, I am 13 weeks pregnant. My doctor has prescribed azithromycin, which is also known as Zithromax, 500 milligrams twice daily. Is this safe for me or the baby? So let's talk a little bit about antibiotics because antibiotics are a very important topic to talk about. Antibiotics are medications that treat bacterial infections. They will not treat viruses. They will not treat funguses. They will not treat yeast. They are strictly for a bacterial infection. Now, um, there are a lot of antibiotics that we can use safely during pregnancy. The reason why it's so important to treat a bacterial infection while you're pregnant is because bacterial infections are one of the most common causes of preterm labor. So preterm labor um, is very significant because if you go into preterm labor um, prior to say 22 weeks of pregnancy, which is when we consider a baby to have the possibility of living outside the belly, then this could result in a miscarriage. So when we take antibiotics, it's very important to take them as directed. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard this because there's something called antibiotic resistance. And this is how that works. When you have bacteria, you can consider them like lines of like an army, right? And when you're taking a medication like Zithromax, you start taking it and it starts taking away. It starts killing off some of that bacteria, the front lines. But the back lines are paying attention to how that works. And so they're trying to figure out how do I defend against this? Now you're knocking out bacteria, which means in like a day or two, you feel so much better. Like you feel amazing. And pregnant women tend to not want to take medication. So you think to yourself, oh my gosh, well, I feel better. Let me just stop taking this because I don't need it anymore. But the problem is all those backline guys, they're still there. They figured out how to beat your Zithromax. So they built up a wall and they called in for reinforcement. So now a couple of days later, you feel bad again. So then you're like, oh, I should have taken the rest of the medication. You start taking it, but now it doesn't work. That is antibiotic resistance in a nutshell. So it's very important if you are diagnosed with a bacterial infection and you decide to take the antibiotic that you take it all, even if you start to feel good. That is very, very important because if you don't and we do get that resistance, we're going to have to treat you with stronger and stronger antibiotics, which may not have as good of a safety profile as Zithromax. So to answer this person's question, yes, Zithromax is safe for use during pregnancy. In fact, studies have shown on animals that you can use four times the dose that we would give to a human being, and there were no signs of any kind of um, birth defects. And just so you guys know, there we cannot ethically study any medications on pregnant women or breastfeeding women. So all we can rely on is different pieces of data, such as animal studies. 
So that was a good question. Hi, Kyle or Kylie. I don't know which. Um, I was just wondering if it's okay that a mom is 40 weeks pregnant. Absolutely, it is okay. 40 weeks is considered full term. And um, I think that it's a great question because I think that we find that a lot of people just keep thinking about um, wanting to have their baby earlier. So just so you guys know, 40 weeks is full term. Any baby born prior to 39 weeks is preterm, premature. So a 37 or 38 weeker is considered a late preterm baby. And that's very important for you guys to understand, especially your 36, 37 weekers. So 37 weekers still have three more weeks, three of brain development to go. And that brain development is key. That brain development is mostly about suck, swallow, breathing coordination. In addition, a 37 weeker does not have as much fat on them and therefore they cannot regulate their temperature and their blood sugar as well as a 40 weeker. So this is why we now know these guys are late preterm babies. And a late preterm baby has a lot of risks, including not being able to breastfeed right, not being able to regulate temperature, which requires them to go to the NICU to be in an isolate, not being able to manage their blood sugar, which means they need IV fluids. So it's really important that you guys understand that. Full term, 40 weeks. Now, sometimes we will induce a mom at 39 weeks of pregnancy. So at 39 weeks is when most of the major organizations say, okay, it's fine to deliver a mom if there's circumstances that warrant an induction. An example could be that you're pregnant with a very large baby and they're concerned about letting the pregnancy go on much longer. But even some pregnancy complications that say 10 years ago we would induce you sooner, we're not doing that anymore. We try to keep you pregnant for as long as possible. Now to the question, 40 weeks, absolutely fine. But what happens when you get to 41? So when you get to 41 weeks, we now are post-dates and we start to worry about the placenta. So um, I had severe hyperemesis with both of my pregnancies. For those of you guys who don't know what that is, that's severe morning sickness. Um, I also have a history of cancer, so I had irregular periods. So when I got pregnant with my second child, we didn't really have a very accurate idea of when I got pregnant. So I had a very early ultrasound, and based off that early ultrasound, we determined my due date. Flash forward to my, you know, 40-week mark. At 40 weeks, um, I was had been very, very very ill. I had lost a lot of weight. And when they did the pregnancy, the ultrasound, my dates seemed off because the baby seemed smaller. And so what ended up happening was they figured they had got my dates wrong. Now understand I had babies almost 20 years ago. Well, 20 years ago. So, um, because of that, you know, ultrasound very different than it is today. So we assumed that my due date was wrong and that I was actually 38 weeks pregnant. So they let me go longer. So when I finally delivered, I delivered at probably about 42 to 43 weeks pregnant. And what happened was the baby, as most post-date babies look like, they're very long and they're very thin. And my placenta had started to fail. And that's why we worry about leaving you post-dates because placentas get old. They do not work indefinitely. So the back of the placenta, which, you know, this is your uterus and applies to the uterine wall. The uterus has a whole bunch of open blood vessels to help bring um, nutrients to the baby and take away toxins. And the placenta also has the same type of thing. And that's how they mesh together. But the placenta, once you go post-dates, can start to calcify. It actually gets hard. And I've seen them where they have little tiny, almost like rocks in them. And all that calcification are blood vessels that are no longer working, which is why it becomes detrimental to the baby. However, up until 41 weeks, we're still okay. That's still usually fine as long as your healthcare provider says there's no other um, risk factors. And then even at 41 weeks, they might let you be induced at say 41 in two days or something like that. So 40 weeks is okay, Kyle. I hope that helped. Please feel free to follow up with that. 
So I had a bleeding question um, this week. I started bleeding three days ago at four weeks and two days, only when I wiped, but my eight, and my HCG was 95. Still bleeding today at four weeks, five days, and it's getting a little worse, but my HCG levels today were 237. I have light tummy pain for the last week, even before the bleeding. I'm scared because I've lost three already in a year, and I've done a pregnancy test today, and it's the darkest line I've had. So this is, um, you know, this is so hard for so many women. And I understand why, you know, she's reaching out to ask kind of, or to give this situation. So HCG, for you guys that don't know that, that's human chorionic gonadotropin. That is the hormone that we test to see if you're pregnant. So when you're peeing on the stick, that's what that stick is looking for. It's looking for HCG. However, that will not give you the number. It simply says there is HCG present in urine. In order to get the number that she's referencing, you have to get a blood test. Given that she had three losses, she's probably being followed very closely. And her doctor, as soon as she got a positive pregnancy test, ordered the first HCG and then ordered what's called a serial HCG. That means a couple days later, you're getting it again. The blood test is the only way for you guys to get that number. Now, HCG levels should double to triple every 72 hours. So going from 95 to 237 is a pretty pretty normal um, jump, which means based on that particular indication, the pregnancy is probably going well. Now, why is she bleeding, right? That's the next question. So there's a couple different reasons why you can bleed. Number one, implantation bleeding. So implantation bleeding is bleeding that happens when the fetus attaches or to the uterine wall and that placenta starts to develop. That usually happens a little bit earlier than that, but it, it is possible that that's what you're seeing. The second thing is something called a subchorionic hemorrhage. So once the placenta forms, again, it's got all these blood vessels and attaches. Well, these blood vessels are going to open up to allow for blood flow. And sometimes what'll happen is you'll get a little pooling of blood underneath the placenta. That's a subchorionic hemorrhage. Think of it like a bruise, okay? So you know how when you get a bruise, you break all those blood vessels and you get that black and blue, right? Well, at first, that bruise can be big and it can be dark and it can be very obvious. But then over time, it shrinks and it gets smaller and lighter. That's kind of how a subchorionic hemorrhage works. Now, there are going to be some women who will have a subchorionic hemorrhage that maintains its size the entire time during their pregnancy, but for most people, the subchorionic hemorrhage will get smaller and smaller, especially as the placenta gets bigger and bigger. When that subchorionic hemorrhage occurs, sometimes you'll get leaking out from underneath the placenta and that can be bleeding. You can also get bleeding from infection. You can get bleeding from um, sex. There's the normal pregnancy hormones, thin out vaginal tissue, and that can cause you to bleed as well. Now, it is concerning to have tummy pain, so you want to be mindful of that. But the other thing you guys should know is that some women will continue to have their normal menstrual cycle. So she's four weeks, right? So this could just be her period. If she had her period four weeks ago, her body simply might not know it's pregnant yet. It might be like, hmm, I don't know what to do here, which is why it's also weird. I mean, how many women have you heard that say they didn't even know they were pregnant? Most of the time that will happen because women continue to bleed and they don't realize that they're pregnant. Yes, you have women who have irregular periods that also occurs and that's why they didn't know, but that's a very common thing. So I will tell you that that is all real possibilities as to what's going on. The best thing for you guys to do if you go ahead and you have any kind of bleeding is to contact your healthcare provider. Um, it's very important for you to contact your healthcare provider so that they can give you guidance on, um, you know, what your next step is. And just so you guys know, for any of you guys who stay until the end of the video, I'm going to give you a sneak peek at tomorrow's video and it may be relevant to some of this information. So the next thing I had a question on, and any of you who are joining us, please feel free to put your questions into the chat, is about baby aspirin. So some doctors are recommending baby aspirin to start taking while trying to conceive and continue that in the first trimester and throughout pregnancy. 
What are your views about that? Okay, so this is a complicated question. I did address some of baby aspirin in a video that I did on preeclampsia, so please check that out. Um, guys, normally we try to throw links into the chat, but as you can see, I am on location. So please check out that preeclampsia video. So baby aspirin is definitely a good thing to take when you're at risk for preeclampsia. That is well known now. It is recommended. Usually you should start by 12 weeks of pregnancy. It used to be, though, that we thought that baby aspirin could help with women who had recurrent miscarriages and other things like that. Now we're starting to figure out that that may or may not be the case. And so the latest research really is very conflicting and very confusing. Here's one of the things I can tell you. Full-blown aspirin, regular aspirin is no during pregnancy. It is not safe. Okay, so you need to be clear if somebody is recommending aspirin during your pregnancy or preconception, they are recommending baby aspirin. And you, if you're not sure that what you picked up is baby aspirin, bring it to your healthcare provider, show them that bottle and say, hey, is this what you were talking about? You should not take regular aspirin. Now, when it comes to baby aspirin, like I said, it's conflicting. There have been some small studies that show that baby aspirin might improve your ability to get pregnant and stay pregnant during IVF cycles, as well as have live births. Um, but again, they're very small. Some of these studies are not, they're not the best studies. They don't address everything. So the data could be flawed, but it seems like there's a possibility. Um, some of the theories behind this, baby aspirin, well, aspirin in general thins out your blood. So remember that placenta, a whole bunch of blood vessels, your uterine wall, a whole bunch of blood vessels. When these connect, we need to have good blood flow. If these are clotting off so that they're clogged and the blood can't flow back and forth, well, your baby's not going to get enough nutrients and the baby won't grow right. And that's kind of where the theory comes in is that if we go ahead and we make sure that the blood is thin enough that it'll go back and forth, then you might not end up with a placenta that does not function and therefore might result in a miscarriage. So what are my thoughts? Honestly, I'm, I, I'm going to tell you that I think it probably needs to be on a case by case basis. I think there's plenty of women where this might be very, very beneficial. And there's other women where I would not do this at all. And unfortunately, I know that's kind of a cop out answer, but that's the truth. Um, it's very, very important that your healthcare for your pregnancy, your preconception, your post-pregnancy is very individualized because we are all different people. We are not a textbook um, and we shouldn't be treated like that. Hi, Obapa. I am a first time mom to be 20 weeks now. When can I feel the baby kick and what can I do for my baby to kick me? Okay. So if you, this is your first time ever being pregnant, your baby has probably been kicking for a while and you may not have even realized it. Okay. And congratulations, by the way. So moms who've had more than one pregnancy will tell you that once you finally figure out what a baby moving is, then you go back and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been feeling it for a couple weeks. And then in subsequent pregnancies, you will feel it even more. Usually it starts out as either like a butterfly feeling or like gas. So if you've ever had gas where you don't have severe gas pain, but you have those bubbles and you can kind of feel those bubbles that in your belly that kind of move around, oftentimes when you're pregnant, that's actually the baby moving. Now, one of the things you can do is you can drink juice. Um, now, you don't want to do this if you're diabetic, but you can drink juice or eat food to try to stimulate a baby to move. And when um, you get further in your pregnancy, if they're doing any kind of stress test, and I have a video on stress tests, if you guys want to check it out, non-stress test, NST. Um, if the baby's not moving the way we want the baby to move, then what we'll do is we'll have a mom like drink some um, juice to see if we can get the baby to move. But right now at 20 weeks pregnant, it's still a little too early. Um, if you are concerned, you could have them do an ultrasound just to make sure. Now, there's one other reason why you might not be feeling your baby, and this has to do with placentas. And actually, let me just check and see if I have any placenta questions. I do not have any placenta questions, which is fine. I just would tie it in. So um, placenta. So there's different 
places in your uterus that your placenta can be positioned. Generally speaking, you have your uterus and the placenta is kind of, for most people, sits on the side, right? It's, it's saying on the side of the uterus. However, there's all different positions that the placenta can be in. And so there's something called placenta previa. And so you have your uterus and your cervix. And a placenta previa is where it's sitting right over the cervix. And so this is a complete placenta previa. This is a partial and this is a marginal, okay, or low lying where it's just sitting right next to that, okay? Now, in addition to that, we have posterior, okay? That's back towards your spine and anterior, which is up towards your belly button. If you have an anterior placenta, that means it's sitting in the front part, your baby could be kicking you like crazy and you might not be feeling it. That's because those little feet may be kicking that placenta, which is like this big, soft, squishy pillow, and you're not going to really notice it at all. Remember, your 20-week baby is still pretty little, okay? Um, that baby is about like this big, for real. Like it's, it's very small right now, okay? So those little kicks, those little feet are maybe like that big. And therefore, it's kind of hard to um, feel them, especially if there's an anterior placenta. Now, one of the ways you can figure out if your placenta is anterior is an ultrasound. So if you're about to have an ultrasound, you can ask them that. If you've already had an ultrasound, you could go back and ask them, did they tell you where it was? And just so you guys know, if you're going in for your, your checkup at your healthcare provider and they can't find the baby's heart rate, and you know how sometimes you'll be there and you'll be listening and it's really hard and they're moving it all around? Well, if you have an anterior placenta, again, that's a placenta towards the front, it can be really hard to hear those heartbeats. And so sometimes we have to really move around to find the spot. So that's also normal. Um, for those of you who are joining me, hi, I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. Please feel free to put some of your questions into the chat. And anybody who stays until the end, I'm going to give you a sneak peek at tomorrow's video. Hi, Jess. So she says, I have been seeing posts on social media saying that it takes two years for a mother to fully recover after birth physically and hormonally. Is there any truth to that? The answer is yes. So I love that over the last, I would say five to 10 years, there's been this movement to start saying the words, it took you 10 months to grow a baby. It should take you 10 months to recover. Okay, that's really a step in the right direction because in our country and in a lot of countries, women are expected to deliver a baby and go back to work like very quickly. And in fact, unfortunately, here in the United States, many women who don't make as much money will be back at work within two weeks, even if they've had a C-section. And this is an unfortunate reality of life for a lot of people. That's not right. And unfor but unfortunately, there's not a lot of mandatory maternity or paternity leave where people are paid so they can stay home and recover. Now, the 10 months to recover thing is a step in the right direction because what it's trying to do is normalize the fact that your body doesn't just bounce back, that there's a whole bunch of things that happen. I mean, I think that a lot of people have also heard the whole, when a baby is born, a mom is born. And I will also tell you when a baby is born, a dad is born. Okay. And that idea is that there's an identity shift and that identity shift should not be underestimated as part of the healing process. This is a big deal. Your life changes and you have to adapt to it. Now, um, let's go on to the two years. There is something called baby spacing. And what is recommended by the WHO for a woman's health is that you wait two years from the time that you deliver a baby before you start trying to have another baby, okay? So understand, I deliver baby today. I don't even attempt to get pregnant for two years. Now, the reason for that is that is how long it takes you to recover physically, emotionally, hormonally, with one exception, which is that it is encouraged in many, many countries to breastfeed for two years. 
Okay. So if you are breastfeeding your child up until age two, then you have that hormonal process still going on, which of course would affect your mood and other things. So yes, there is complete truth to it. And baby spacing, again, waiting two years before you attempt to get pregnant again, is life-saving. For so many women, this is the difference between life and death because it gives our bodies a chance to heal. It gives your uterus a chance to contract back down and heal. It gives your hormonal levels a chance to stabilize. It cannot be underestimated how important that two years is. And yes, it is absolutely true. It is scientifically based. Now, that was a great question, Jess. I like that question. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. Please feel free to put anything you have into the chat. So is Bisa Prolol safe while breastfeeding? Okay. So, um, this is a blood pressure med, um, that is in the category of beta blockers. So beta blockers are, um, these meds that help reduce blood pressure and they help to reduce heart rate. Okay, so they're very good meds to take when you have blood pressure issues. Um, and so generally speaking, beta blockers as a whole are safe. Bisoprosol is not commonly used and it is not the number one recommended for pregnancy and breastfeeding. If you are having um, issues related to um, your blood pressure, the most common beta blocker that is used is labetalol. And I will tell you, labetalol is extremely effective. I've seen it used many times and I really think that that's um, the way you want to go. So if your healthcare provider is asking you to use bisoprolol, what you want to do is find out why. You want to say to them, like, what's going on? Now, now, there's a variety of reasons why they could have wanted this. For starters, unfortunately, in today's day and age, we have a lot of supply chain issues. This means that there are a lot of medications that are not available. It could simply mean that in your area, that's not a medication that's available right now. Or I'm sorry, labetalol is not available. It could also mean that bisoprolol is the medication that's used more commonly in your area than labetalol is where I'm at. So that's really kind of one of those things. In the end, bisoprolol is considered safe as long as risks versus benefits are addressed, um, but labetalol is more commonly used. I will also tell you from personal experience, I have no experience with bisoprolol. I have extensive experience with labetalol, and I will tell you, and I've been talking to a couple people recently in the office, that it's, um, in my opinion, not dosed very properly. Um, so I find OBGYNs and maternal fetal medicine doctors and even cardiologists will dose it twice a day, so 9 a.m., 9 p.m., but it's funny, in the hospital, when we give labetalol, we get much better results when we do every eight hours. So I don't know if they will eventually change the protocols for outpatients so that women are receiving labetalol every eight hours versus every 12. But I can tell you in the hospital, same milligram strength, we will get use it every eight hours and get a much better result. Um, okay, what can I do to reduce protein in my urine? Um uh, unfortunately, nothing. So protein in the urine, for those of you guys who don't know, is not normal. Protein in the urine is something that we check for. So if for any of you guys who are pregnant, every time you're going to the um, that your healthcare provider, they ask you to pee in a cup. And what they're doing is they're testing for a couple of things, one of them being protein. Okay. They test for protein, sugar, which is in the form of ketones. They look for blood and a couple of different things. Protein is a sign that your kidneys are not working right. The reason why your kidneys wouldn't be working right in pregnancy, generally speaking, is because you have blood pressure issues. Generally speaking, you have blood pressure issues because you are developing preeclampsia. And so preeclampsia, one of the things we look for is protein in the urine. So just tracing it back to the beginning. Unfortunately, once you start seeing protein, which is spilling into the urine, there's not much you can do to stop it. So now what you need to do is be focusing on controlling your blood pressure, monitoring your blood pressure, and, and going from there. But you can't stop it once it's started. It's just, it's probably just going to get worse. So the thing we want to do is keep your blood pressure under control. Um, 
Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. Hi. I am currently on location. For those of you who can't tell, this is not my normal getup, but I am going to be filming on location soon. Um, we're here for another one of our Q&As. Please feel free to put any questions you have into the chat like so many of my viewers have. I'm going to continue answering questions that I've gotten on the videos this week. And for those of you who stay until the end, I will give you a sneak peek at next week's video. Um, so we had a question. Actually, we had like a comment and it's kind of comment question. And I really liked it and I wanted to share it. So it says, um, I'm breastfeeding and I got put on 20 milligrams of fluoxetine. That's Prozac if anybody doesn't recognize the generic name. Is this safe? Nobody has taken the time to talk with me because I was on this as a young adult. Please answer and thank you for your video. So I, I really loved this question. This is obviously a passion area. So I started in labor delivery, mother, baby, that area of the hospital. And then I moved into psychiatry. So I actually do psychiatry now. And I work with women who are pregnant, postpartum, preconception, and I, I medicate them when necessary. And I feel very strongly that we should be able to allow pregnant people to be medicated for their mood disorders. Um, the evidence shows that untreated anxiety and depression can lead to far worse um, effects, including miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth, a baby that's small for gestational age, babies that struggle um, with their sugar, uh, babies who have like developmental issues later on, versus if you give somebody medication for that and they treat that like Prozac, that baby's risk go way down. See, we think that taking a medication increases risk, but in fact, many times it reduces risks. And just so you guys know, just walking down the street, every single person who gets pregnant has a 2% risk factor minimum of having a birth defect spontaneously happen. So this, it's not like um, these medications somehow increase your risk dramatically. Sure, there's some, but not all of them. Prozac is an SSRI. That means it's a serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. Sorry. It boosts serotonin. Serotonin is needed to help manage depression and anxiety. So that's what Prozac's job is. Prozac is safe for pregnancy and it is safe for breastfeeding. Now, what is one of the things I would tell you about Prozac? It's not my favorite. It's not the one I go for first. Why? So Prozac has a very long half-life, so it lasts a really long time in your system. So for women who it doesn't work for and we need to take them off of it, it takes a long time to get out of their system. Now we can switch you over to something different in the meantime. Two things can be given at the same time, but it does stay in your system a long time. I also find that Prozac sometimes has higher side effects. Now these are not side effects that would make the pregnancy in danger or hurt the baby. These are side effects like it can make people numb. Uh, it can also cause weight gain. But for some people, it's a miracle drug and it does not have any of those side effects. So just understand Prozac is still a great drug and it's still in my top 10, but it's not one of my favorites up front. Um, now, what about the baby? So if you read online about taking an SSRI during pregnancy, you're going to hear about something called withdrawal syndrome in the baby. It sounds scary. Withdrawal syndrome in a baby from an SSRI is not as bad as that sounds. So withdrawal syndrome simply means that the baby goes cold turkey off of the Prozac. So your baby is going to get the SSRI, Prozac, um, Lexapro, Zoloft, whatever it is, Cymbalta, Effexor, those are another class. They get some of that through the placenta. Okay. But just like the Prozac makes you feel good, it makes your baby feel good. Okay. Serotonin is good for everybody. So the baby does okay with that serotonin. It's, it's not really that big of a deal to the baby during the pregnancy. But now the baby's getting it through the placenta. So here's your placenta and then you give birth. And what do you do? You give birth to the placenta. So out it goes. And the baby is immediately withdrawing from that medication. Immediately. Okay? So we would try to taper you if you were just trying to get off of Prozac because we want you to not have any withdrawal effects. And what are withdrawal effects? You feel shaky, irritable, you get a headache, your stomach's bothering you, you're nauseous, right? It's nothing crazy. You're not addicted. What happens is when I give you serotonin, okay, your brain makes serotonin. It's got a serotonin factory going on. When you have anxiety or depression, 
that's not working right. And so you have these receptors that are open. And because they're open, that's what's making you feel anxiety and depression because this is supposed to be full. So I come in with Prozac and I fill up this receptor. And now you feel good. But what happens is when I start filling it up from the outside, your brain goes, wait, I can take a break. Like I can go on vacation now. Like I can go to Hawaii and off it goes. And what it's really doing, it's resting. Your brain is taking the time. That factory that's broken is taking the time to heal. So I, in essence, give it a vacation so it can just relax. So now I'm filling, right? Okay. Now, if I just stop that medication, boom, everything opens all at once. But what did I just say? The factory is off in Hawaii on vacation, right? So all of a sudden, every single receptor opens at once and your brain's got to go, whoa, wait a second. I got to do what now? And it gets on a plane to come back, right? Okay. So now if I taper you, right? So I take a little bit away and then a little bit away. What happens is the first little drop, a couple receptors open up and your brain's like, oh, okay. It's time for me to come back. Okay. Okay. I'm back. Okay. I'm going to fill these up. So then I take away a little bit more. So a couple more open up, brain kicks in production, and there we go. Baby doesn't get that luxury. So what do we do as providers? Well, for one, towards the end of your pregnancy, if you're doing well, a provider will drop your dose, which means the baby will be used to less of the medication. And number two, if you breastfeed postpartum and you are taking the medication, there will be some of that medication in your breast milk. So the baby can start to taper off that way. Now, if you can't do either of those, which is fine, what do you have? You have a baby who might be a little shaky. The baby might be irritable. The baby might not eat as well as you would like. Um, And honestly, you might have like a baby who's kind of like a high-pitched cry. What do you do? You feed that baby as much as you can. You give that baby lots of love, lots of skin to skin, and pacifiers. And within five to 10 days, the baby will feel much better. And honestly, if you're just constantly feeding that baby, whether it's breast or formula, baby's going to do just fine. And withdrawal syndrome is not a guarantee. It's a possibility. And and so you may not even have any issues. But untreated anxiety and depression can put your baby in a far worse state at birth than having effective treatment. So that's my stuff about that. Um, epidurals. So I had a comment on the epidurals. So expectant mother here, I'm a few months away and I'm terrified of the epidural. People keep telling me how it's great, but those side effects seem crazy to me and not worth the risk. I mean, I don't have a great pain tolerance, but it seems not, it seems for numbing the pain, you make it harder on your body. So, um, I think this was a great comment. It came on my epidural, um, video. And so one of the things that I'm going to tell you is, you know, epidurals, you know, I can see why a lot of people are like, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing ever. And I can see why a lot of people are like, oh my God, I can't believe that I'm even considering this. Like, this was so horrible. My friend did this and my friend did that. It's really a personal choice. I would encourage you guys, if you're thinking about not having an epidural, you want to make sure that you have other pain medication options available to you. And one of the most effective ones is actually hypnobirthing. And I think I have a video on that, but you can definitely look into hypnobirthing. Hypnobirthing is a very effective strategy for dealing with um, pain um, during labor. Also having a doula. And I definitely have a video on doulas. Doulas are amazing birth support. And doulas are very good at helping you manage the pain homeopathically. Um, Some hospitals will offer nitrous. That's the laughing gas you'll get during um, dental treatment. And some places will offer you IV narcotics. Now, I can tell you up front, I am not a fan of IV narcotics. The narcotics is stuff like Percocet or something like that. The thing is, is that while it's hitting your bloodstream right away, it's getting to the baby a couple hours later. So oftentimes a mom will get it and have pain relief at six, seven, eight centimeters, but the baby is two hours old when that narcotic's hitting them and all of a sudden we have a baby that's not breathing right. So I'm not a big fan of that. Um, Epidurals are not as bad as a lot of you might imagine, but I do do 
do encourage you to please look into it ahead of time. Please, please, please ask all the questions you need to. Ask the hospital if you can meet with anesthesia so that they can answer your questions before you're in active labor. Because once you're there, you need to understand whether you're willing to consent to that or not. Um, because you don't want to be making that decision out of fear while you're actively in labor. The other thing is, if you need to have an emergency C-section, they're going to try to do a spinal, which is very similar to an epidural. And so if you know that you would consent to that during that um, type of circumstance, I would encourage you to just be looking more actively into the epidural. But I understand why you're hesitant. And it for some people, the epidural is like amazing and there's nothing wrong with it. And for other people, they do have some complications. And it's just something that's very individual and personalized. I had two epidurals and I can tell you one of them was like afterwards, my recovery was like nothing. I don't remember any issues. The other one, I remember I had a sore back for a couple of days. I, I mean, I remember that, but it wasn't anything crazy, but that's just me. I'm me and my, my own person. The other things that you guys should be aware of is that epidurals, um, if you have any kind of back surgery, if you have any kind of musculoskeletal injury from like accident or something like that, you will need to talk to an anesthesiologist. They understand what's going on so they can determine if you're eligible. Um, and then just, you know, the worst part of an epidural is actually the lidocaine to numb you. And I've been in many rooms where women have gotten epidurals. So I've been there. I've seen it at, from a healthcare provider. I've had lidocaine. Lidocaine hurts like crazy. And that's actually the worst part. The actual um, epidural placement is really not a big deal for most people. Um, I had a question on our GBS um, video. GBS is group beta strep. So if you have a urinary tract infection during pregnancy, can you check it from urine, meaning the GBS infection. I have regular urine checks, but they don't check what kind of bacteria is in the urine. I have to have a C-section, but I worry the baby may catch it during the pregnancy. So um, this is a very interesting question. It kind of has a couple pieces to it. So for starters, they can test your urine for group beta strep. It's not commonly seen there. And if they're testing your urine for bacteria, they're testing what kind of bacteria. What they do is once they identify bacteria, they take that urine, they put it onto like a Petri dish and they grow it to see what kind of bacteria they're dealing with. Now, the thing, reason why we don't just go with a urine catch is that that urine catch may only identify GBS in the urethra. So the urethra is that little tube that goes from the outside up to the bladder, okay? So it's a little short tube. It's kind of in front of your vagina and below your clitoris. So you might have GBS there, and then you might um, you might not have GBS there, but you might have it in the vagina or the anus, okay? So when we do a GBS swab, we're swabbing the vagina and the anus and sending that off. Group beta strep is not a sexually transmitted disease. It's just a normal bacteria that's found in, in that area. Some women have it, some women don't. Some women will have it for one pregnancy and not have it for another. It just is completely dependent on a lot of factors. How do we treat it? Penicillin. So if we know that you have a GBS infection, we are going to go ahead and we're going to give you IV penicillin. That means we're putting an IV catheter into your vein and we're giving it to you like in a bag. And we're going to give it to you every four hours um, to treat that infection. If um, we don't know if you have GBS, like if you never got tested, let's say you deliver early because we usually swab you again around 36 weeks. Let's say you're 35 weeks or you didn't get the swab or whatever. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll proactively give you penicillin. Okay. Now, if you're going to have a C-section and we know that you have GBS, we're going to give you either penicillin or ampicillin is very common. So they're going to actually give you that medication while you're delivering, like before and while you're delivering the baby. This is going to allow for some of that to cross over the placenta into the baby's bloodstream to help treat it if the baby was to have it. Now, for moms who don't get adequate treatment or if there's any concern, babies are actually tested post um, delivery for GBS and we monitor them. If there's any signs of infection, 
we're retesting to make sure and we'll treat the baby in the NICU. That's the neonatal intensive care unit. They get the same type of treatment. It's basically penicillin and an IV. And that's it. That's all we have to do to take care of it. However, um, you know, it's not something I would worry about too much. I would just ask them, have you been testing me? And make sure you are swabbed for GBS towards the end of your pregnancy. So... Um, what is the difference between an epidural and a spinal? It's the placement of the catheter. Um, it's basically like um, in the epidural space versus the spinal um, space. And it's in, I forget the names of the actual spaces, but it's literally just a spacing thing. So the epidural is a little bit, um, how do I put it? So... The epidural can be managed in a lighter way. So we can still numb you into complete, like, like complete numbness so that you can have a C-section. However, the epidural, it's easier to manage the anesthesia lighter so that you can have feeling of your legs and you can feel when you're pushing. If we aren't even going there and we are going straight to a C-section with a spinal, the spinal is just a different location and it's a lot easier to just knock out the um, numbness, like the feeling, with a smaller amount of medication. So that, that's really it. If you have an epidural and you need an emergency C-section, they can use that epidural for your anesthesia. They just amp up how much medication they're giving you. But it's just location of where they're putting in the catheter that they're going to use. Um, and just so you guys know, in case you didn't know this, like when you get an IV, there's the needle, but the needle has like a plastic shaft over it. And so we put it into the vein and then we take out the needle. So all that's left in there is this flexible like straw. And that's why you can bend and move, right? Same thing with the spinals. I think a lot of people get really nervous because they think there's some metal in their body. And if they move too much, it's going to be a big deal. But it's not. It's, it, is, it is just like a very thin, flexible piece of material. It's, it's not a big deal. It bends. It moves. It would do whatever it needed to do in that space. It's basically like threading something into a vein. You're, you're totally fine. And then we do tape it very carefully because in the case of like an epidural where you're in labor, so what happens is you've got that little catheter in the middle of your back, right? And then they have a line that usually they tape all the way up the back. And then it's usually taped somewhere up here to your shoulder. And then you've got this tube going out to a medication pump, right? Well, we do all that taping. It's not because something crazy is going back on there. Sorry, going on back there. It's because when you're in labor, you move around. Even if you don't feel stuff, we need to get you in a position. We need to flip you, all this other stuff. And so we want to make sure that epidural stays in place because it's not like it's going to do something crazy if it pulls out. It just means we're going to have to stick you again. So we want to make sure it's taped up just like an IV. Um, next one. I got a question comment that said, um, I'm, uh, this is on postpartum hemorrhage. I'm currently six weeks postpartum. At four weeks postpartum, my blood went from dark red to bright red. I am not soaking pads. It's moderate bleeding, but just bright red. Now and again, the blood is dark red, and then it goes back to bright red. Sometimes I stop bleeding completely for an hour or two, and then it starts up again. Should I be concerned? The answer is yes. Yes, you should be concerned. This does not sound like normal bleeding. Most women, by the time they are six weeks postpartum, they are no longer bleeding at all. Okay, so bright red bleeding is active bleeding, and this is something that should be addressed. Your bleeding should go from like bright red, lots of blood, some clots right after delivery, to by the time you're leaving the hospital, like a very heavy period, to within two weeks, you're going from a bright red to maybe a darker red to like a pink, dark pink to like a medium pink to a light pink to clear. That's like what it should look like. And it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. When you're still having heavy bleeding like that, you want to make sure you're getting it checked out. Okay. Um, you want to make sure nothing else is going on. So what could be going on? Well, there's a number of things and I'm not going to get into all of them, but here is one common thing and that is retained placenta. 
And one of the other ways you can kind of think to yourself about whether you have retained placenta is did you have trouble with your milk supply? So retained placenta, your placenta is supposed to come off. Sometimes a little tiny piece will stay inside the uterine wall. When that happens, the uterus can't contract back down the way it's supposed to. When the uterus, this is all open blood vessels. When the uterus clamps down, those blood vessels close. So if this stays open, you still got blood coming out, right? Now, if you have a little tiny piece of placenta right here, the uterus can't close all the way. And now all this stuff is still open, right? Now, the other reason why I said the milk supply is that when the placenta is attached, your body is running off of different hormones than the hormones needed for um, making milk. The hormones for making milk is primarily prolactin. And that does not occur until the placenta detaches, which tells your body you are no longer pregnant. If a little tiny piece is there, your body does not get that signal and you don't make milk. And so a lot of women will come to lactation consultants with true supply issues and they'll be pumping exactly how they're supposed to and they're latching and the baby's doing well. As far as the latch looks good, there's no tongue tie. We've ruled out everything and they're not making milk, right? There's no medical reason. So then we'll say to them, are you still bleeding heavy? And if the answer is yes, we recommend they go back to their healthcare provider to have an ultrasound and possibly a DNC to scrape out the uterine wall because there's probably a piece of placenta in there. Okay. Um, last two questions. Any of you guys who have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, I'm pregnant and I feel an orgasm while I sleep and my belly also gets tight. Is this normal? It only happens while I am sleeping. So the answer is probably normal. It depends on how far along you are. Um, just so you guys know, orgasm is caused by, um, pro, uh, sorry, not prolactin, oxytocin. So oxytocin is the um, hormone responsible for uh, milk ejection. It's the one that says take send the milk out. It's the hormone that's responsible for uterine contractions. That's why we give you Pitocin. That's synthetic or man-made oxytocin. And it's the love hormone. So this is the hormone that causes you or allows you to have an orgasm, which is also when you have an orgasm, you get some uterine contractions during that time. And it kind of gives you a bonding type of experience with your partner. So when you have an orgasm, it's very common for you to bond and oxytocin is what drives that, okay? And so for people who didn't know this, some women will have orgasms while they breastfeed. And the reason why this happens is oxytocin is the milk ejection hormone, okay? So it's telling the body to send out the milk well, because you have such a high oxytocin level going at that time, it will sometimes cause you to feel really pleasurable and to possibly have an orgasm, which can be very unsettling for a mom because that is not a sexual activity for them. And yet this is very much happening. And then they think they're some weirdo and they're not weird. It is simply hormonal. So that's actually a real thing that happens. And it does not mean the mom is not normal. She's very normal. It is rare, but it does happen. So um, it, that can be normal for this person. Depends on a lot of things. All right. Last one. So this is not really a question. It was a comment and it came on one of my um, videos. That's one of my most passionate areas of talking, which is postpartum depression in fathers. So it said, I feel like my fiance and I have had this together to the point where we're both always angry and then get angry at each other, even when we weren't mad at ourselves. And now she broke up with me, even though I want to get through this. It's been very painful because I love my girlfriend and I want to come home to my daughter, not visit her every other week. So postpartum depression in fathers, and I really also like to say partners, um, is very common. If the mom has any kind of mood disorder, um, the father is at a 50% chance of developing postpartum depression. Um, it's a complicated mood issue. It can be hidden by a lot of different things, including um, being hidden by ADHD, 
Many dads will um, respond by throwing themselves into work. They'll become planners. You'll find that they're buying life insurance and investing in stuff and wanting to buy a house and making the wills. They get very hyper-focused on planning for the future. Um, they may engage in some risky behaviors. You may see them gambling or smoking or drinking. Um, they will oftentimes present with somatic symptoms. So somatic symptoms include headaches, back aches, stomach aches. So these are all very common. Um, it's very, very challenging to be a partner in this world. And I'm not saying that moms don't have it hard. They do. But being the partner is also hard because we live in a society where mom rules, where everybody talks about how important she is and everything that, you know, needs to happen with her. But we also need to support the dads. And dads have dads are going to be flawed. They're going to say the wrong thing. They're going to do the wrong thing. Um, and they can't, it's unfortunate because then a lot of the pregnant women, they're very hormonal, things are going on and they don't always respond well. The other problem is, is that we use a lot of general terms. I want better communication. I need more help. Well, if a dad thinks he's doing more and he doesn't have a specific thing to do, then he may think he's helping when he's not really helping. And then he's resentful because he was helping because he didn't get good direction. And that's another complicated story for another day. The most important thing for us to realize is that both parents need support, both of them. We need to help support them. We need to help encourage good communication. We need to remind couples that the most important thing is that they do well together, that they feel loved together. The house doesn't matter. The kids can eat McDonald's every day. None of that stuff is important. The most important thing is mental health and just staying together as a unit. So thank you all for staying with me. I promised you I would get give you a sneak peek at tomorrow's video. Um, as I alluded before, um, it's kind of about bleeding. So I am very passionate about educating women, especially women of color, on how to um, make sure that you're getting proper care in the hospital. Um, unfortunately, it is very well known that women of color are not going to receive um, the best maternity care that other women, especially women who look like myself, will get. And that's not right and it's not fair. And so when you're going into a hospital, it's very important that you understand when you're bleeding that you understand what to ask for, what they should be doing, and understand if you are being discharged, what the next steps are. So my video tomorrow is what to ask when you go to the hospital when you are bleeding during pregnancy. So please check that out. I am Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. We are here every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to answer your questions live, as well as questions that you submitted onto the videos on our channel. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Subscribing really helps me out as a content provider, and I really appreciate your support. Please hit the notification bell so you can get notified of our latest content, like tomorrow's um, video on what to ask when you are bleeding at the hospital. Um, please share the channel with your friends and family. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional content. We will link those into the description below. I really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember, like and subscribe. Um, I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor on location. Bye for now.